um, got a 30 by 24 piece of hardboard here that I toned with a little bit of red, yellow, blue, white, a lot of white, a little bit of matte medium, and a little bit of gloss medium all together. So it's got kind of a nice finish. Now, while I was drawing, I stepped on it a few times. So I got some nice boot marks, but they're really not going to matter. I'm just being honest. I'm going to painting an old oak tree. It's about 300 years old. It's at Pickberry Vineyards, where I paint it on location quite often. Usually when I go there, because the lighting's always different, I take some photos. And so this is a photograph I shot while I was there. But I have painted this tree two or three times on site. Uh, not this specific composition. I don't know what I'm going to do. I might just almost get rid of this. We'll see. So no, it's kind of a... Uh, what do they call those? Kind of manzanita type of a tree back in there. This is up above Sonoma Valley. So I'm actually just starting with a little bit of cad orange and I'm gonna draw a little different. I'm gonna draw with a color. So I'm gonna draw with a little cad orange hue and a little bit of a uh, alizarin together. We're just gonna kind of come in. We're gonna kind of put in this horizon. I do wanna really have fun with all of this. Uh, so I might even wanna lower that. I. I I want to get all the, the shadows, the dappled light in there. So we're going to come in, we're going to center this. This is like a portrait of a tree. So when you do any sort of portraits, generally you're almost always symmetrical. So in this case, it's here, here, we're just going to spring it up, have, have some fun and kind of my drawing, uh, allow myself to kind of mess up a little bit. So I kind of scribbled a little bit in here. Same in here. You know, it goes back. I have this theory I used to, partly tongue in cheek that I used to give out to a lot of students. I said, if you make a whole bunch of lines, one of them is bound to be correct. So it's kind of what I'm doing here. That's just about center. So I should probably be over a little bit more right about there. And we got a nice V down in here, nice thick part of the trunk. I, this whole tree is so cool. Um, We'll kind of come down, we'll bring it down. That's where the tree is going to sit down here. It goes up, up, kind of falls back into shadow. But we can, if you look really carefully, you can see the, the branch work its way across here. And there's a lot of foliage that happens in here and in here. Just have fun with your sketch. Don't, don't get too hung up with ultra accuracy. Again, I look at accuracy, with the exception of doing really full-on portraits, I look at accuracy as something that I really want as the thing comes to completion. And then there's trees back behind. And there's a mountain back here. And this will be solid trees back in here. We have this. And we have Let's see, foliage that comes, it works its way down here. I might get, I think I am gonna get that tree in because I like there's certain movements in that tree. I don't think I'm gonna do it real thick like that. I think we'll do it kind of like this. So it's thinner at, at the base, but I do kind of like part of that coming off. In any event, we've got enough information down here to, to at least begin doing our lay-in. So this is, was the number two flat. I'll go back to one of my, uh, people keep asking me about these. I get it on Facebook all the time. These are just inexpensive and I get them from Dick Blick. You can get them, I bought these from Home Depot. They're not as good, but it's the same thing. They're both inch brushes. The Dick Blick gesso brush tends to be a better bristle um, for me. Again, for someone else might, might be different. So we're gonna start uh, literally, I think I'll map in some of the darks in the tree instead of the sky. So for that, I have, uh, let me very briefly, my palette today. I have a little bit of unbleached titanium, titanium white, um, Naples yellow, uh, just spectrum yellow, I think it is, or cad yellow, medium hue, like it's one of the two, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, cad orange hue, alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue, sap green, and burnt umber today. Burnt umber, not, I'm not using sap green. But I know my paint is going to glide a little bit more because it has some gloss on it. So it's good. It's almost like working a little bit on um, an oil ground because it's going to be a little bit more slippery, which I kind of like. I, I mean, I change it up a lot. You guys 
know that. And so I'm not a, um, an individual that gets hung up in, it has to be one way because each way has its own potential and it's a matter of view. So in this case, I get a lot of lighting paint where it's not seeping in, uh, which will probably make it stay wet a little bit longer, but I'm actually able to get a much more of a transparent kind of interesting quality to the, to the paint. And you can actually, some guys put it on and take it off. In other words, they'll apply it. This is kind of a thin coat. You can kind of see through it. It's almost like a, it's almost like a acrylic scumble or a watercolor, um, because you you can put it on and then I can almost almost remove it completely. Watch. What's the green that you have on the palette? The green I have sap green. You do have sap. And burnt umber. And burnt umber. I'm using burnt umber because I feel didn't feel I needed to go. Uh, with a, a red, a deeper red brown. So. Is that a buff titanium or buff? Sorry. Yeah, it's unbleached titanium, buff titanium. Let me see what exactly. It's by Gam one and it's a titanium buff, it's called. But unbleached titanium, some, you know, every brand, some, not with all colors, but they, they will tend to come up with their own um, way of describing that color. I have a little bit of turf and a little bit of medium, both in this paint. And we want to get back in here, a little bit of a cast shadow, which is kind of indicate very, because now if I'm doing a watercolor, by the way, I'm going to be much more careful with that shadow. All right. But because I know I'm using an opaque paint, I can come over it, change it, do whatever I want with it, that I can be. Uh, messed up. And it's one of the advantages to working with any opaque medium, be it oil, uh, acrylic, gouache, pastel, any medium that is opaque gives you a little bit of recovery process. Where watercolor, you can, I mean, that's why when I've done watercolor, I've actually done it on gesso because I can remove it much the same as I can oil. So, and I learned that trick from uh, Bert Silverman, Paul. And he's got a, a book called Breaking the Rules, it's watercolor, Breaking the Rules, which is really kind of a cool book because it's, it's very non-traditional ways of using watercolor. Uh, it works well for opaque painters. So there we have kind of the approximation of that tree. We get a little bit of approximation of, of the foliage without going heavily into it, simply because I want to get the sky in later. So we're going to have some of it here, down here, and I just took the brown and blue that I was working with and I threw some sap green into it. That's basically uh, what I'm using for this. And this is gonna be done on layers. A little bit more sap green, a little bit more burnt umber. Looks like I might need a little, oh, I've got it right there. Uh, more, particularly of the burnt umber. I'm using a lot of burnt umber simply due to the fact that we have a lot of darks and the darks are flirting, slightly warm, slightly cool. So burnt umber is my kind of go-to guy, so to speak, in that regard. So just kind of indicate about where this foliage is. And I use that word about simply because I might move things around more forgiving. And it's generally the way I paint trees anyway. It's not the ways I'm, I think everyone paints trees, but it, it works for me. And uh, different types of pressure. Uh, people don't talk enough about that, I think painters in general, but the kind of pressure you use on your brush uh, has a lot to do with the way your paint is distributed. It's not just uh, a even handed uh, amount of pressure that you're constantly working. It's, you're really working the paint. And I haven't used any mediums, so to speak. A little bit, I actually, I shouldn't say that. I used a little bit of the um, solvent-free gel, but almost none. 
So abstractly, in a, in a very, if you blur your eyes at this, by the time I get this foliage in here, value of the foliage, value and color of it, um, by the time I get that in there, if you blur your eyes at both the reference or your subject, if you're on location, and what you've got on your canvas or board thus so far, it should have a similar, not exact because you haven't been exact, but it should have a really similar design characteristic to it. And back here from this tree, I just, I'm gonna press harder. And what'll happen is that my paint will go, won't go down as thick. Because it won't go down as thick, it'll be, it's number one, it's slightly more transparent. And number two, it's not as dark, which falls in beautifully with keeping it in the background. I don't want it to be maybe as dark as all of this. So I'm just kind of rubbing. So you can see, you can actually hear that I'm just kind of rubbing that paint in. Tom wanted to know if those were shoe prints on the canvas. Yes, they, yes they, are. they are shoe prints from when I when I toned this thing about three weeks ago. Um, I, I usually when I tone in my lamb, I tone them in acrylic generally, and if, then I lay it down on the um, on my floor, and. Sometimes I'm doing a whole bunch of them. Sometimes I'm just doing one or two. But inevitably, inevitably, I end up walking on one of them. Sometimes I don't notice it, as in this case. Sometimes I notice it and I kind of fix it right away. But in this case, I didn't notice it. So that's, you can kind of see, this is kind of, this is, I, for lack of a better word, let's call it, we're rubbing paint around right now. It's, it's what technically is referred to as a scumble. The scumble is kind of a dry application of wet paint, meaning you're kind of rubbing it around almost like you would do with a, with a pastel. All right, so we have kind of the overall structure of this thing set up. Um, I'm gonna paint a little bit of these trees in the background to go a little more opaque now. So I'm picking, I picked some, nap uh, not Naples, um, yellow ochre and some Naples together along with that green. Still have a lot of brown and stuff in my brush. So let's see what this looks like. Not bad. I want it warmer under as a underpainting. So I just threw a little bit of burnt sienna into that color. Just a little bit. Now you might say, why do you want it warmer? And I'm going to tell you, I like painting greens, particularly foliage, with warms. So I force myself to not go too green as I'm building the piece. And that's simply, it helps a lot. So kind of that area in there, and then this area over here a little bit, and it falls up in here. So we're gonna go a little bit lighter. So that I just threw a little yellow, maybe a little Naples back into that same color. Well, that went a little too, it, it went a little too lime on me. So I'm bringing a little bit more, um, ochre back into that color. Feels a little bit better, not great. So if it isn't warm enough, I, this time I threw cat orange hue. And I kind of like it when things mess up a little bit. And by that, I mean, when the color I was planning maybe isn't quite as good and pure, maybe it's a little off, because then I have to work with that later and what happens is this whole painting starts to have a little bit more interest and not as boring as it might be, for lack of a better uh, expression. So uh, there was a figure over in that corner. So if you look on the left side of my reference, if it even shows, I had a, there was a figure in there. I painted the figure out because I don't know that the figure would want to be seen. That's the main reason. It's friend. And I didn't want to put a figure. It just, it was not, designed, this is designed as a landscape. Part of the reason that I decided on, I'm gonna do some sheep today, I'll probably do those in a couple of weeks. But part of the, re one of the reasons that I picked this today is I know the last two weeks um, I've had figurative works. And so I try and change it up as often as I can. If, if my mind allows me to think that clearly, 
uh, and in this case, it did. So put some of the semi-darks back into that area. Um, and I'm gonna actually clean that brush a little bit. And I think we'll, I think I'll move up to the sky. Now I could stay with another brush, but I'm, because I have about four of these. So I don't have to necessarily clean them, but I'm gonna take white and a little of my blue, ultramarine blue. And it's very near white. In fact, it's quite blue up here, not blue enough. Now you gotta keep in mind, I'm painting on kind of a semi pink orange uh, tone there. I like that blue better. Get a little bit. And what are you using for that? Excuse me? What did you use for that? Mix up that blue? Ultramarine white. And I still have a little residue of some, you know, the brush is clean, but it's not really clean. And if I press really hard out of the ferrule, I know I would get other colors coming out that I probably, right now I don't want. So why wouldn't you switch brushes then? I don't know. <laughs> I would normally. Um, I wanna save them for something else. There's a reason, huh? You have a million of them. I, no, I only have four of those. Okay. And two of them are, are the kind I like, and two of them are. I'm going to actually pick up some more this next week when I'm in San Francisco. Different kind of edge, different kind of pressures, different kind of strokes to make it feel like I'm painting the negative areas of the, uh, the tree holes, so to speak, or the negative areas of the sky. A little bit right about in here. A little bit back in here. You can always put too much in. It's not gonna hurt. And it gets whiter, which means the sun is probably coming over from over in that area. So what I will do when I get down a little bit further, I'm gonna take some more white and Naples and mix it right into that color. Okay, so we're gonna take white and Naples. I mix that, those two colors right into the color and it's real sticky, it's real dry and sticky, which is okay, I don't mind that. So where do I wanna hit it? I wanna hit it right here with the V. of the tree and right down here. And they're really white, a little bit of blue areas sneaking out. We'll put that in later, put it in now, put it in later. It almost doesn't matter, just up to when you want to put it in. Okay, so we're gonna go whiter right there. Whiter, and Naples. Okay. All right, we're gonna go right here. So it's very white. Paint's a little too dry, so I added a little bit of medium to it. And that's a feeling that you have to, I swear, this is one of the hard things to try and actually teach, you can explain it, but it's something that everyone has to feel and experience um, as to when your paint feels like it's too dry, when it feels like you need more paint on your brush, when it's too wet. All of those are experiences that you will develop the more you paint. But initially it's pretty, it's, we can talk about it. I can tell everybody what I'm doing, but you can't feel what I'm feeling. And, you know, it's unfortunate, but right here. I kind of like the tactile quality of some of the stuff that I've just done. A lot of that has to do with solvent free gel, by the way. You can get a wonderful kind of a tactile feeling. It's a lot of tree holes that you're never going to get them all. 
So don't even try. Just get the big ones that make sense design-wise for your piece. Okay, so we have kind of what I need to have going on. Um, I still need to get more of the of the um, trees back in here. We'll bring it down just a little bit. We'll bring it now. If I bring it up, what I'm doing is I'm kind of indicating the edges qualities of the foliage. So we you know, a little bit of that goes a long way. You can actually do it, leave it alone, and you may not have to go back and touch it again. It may work just fine. But then again, you may have to go back and do some work on it. It's one of those things you don't know until you really, your painting gets far enough. I think that's probably an important point to bring up really for everybody is a lot of the stuff you will assess as you're doing it. And in many instances, it's not gonna be, it'll look good at that particular point, but as you kind of go further into the painting, it may need some additional work. So keep your mind open. It's not finished until you say it's finished. You know, or, or you'll never do a bad painting. You'll just do a bunch of unfinished paintings. Okay, so let's go in, let's leave that alone right now. Let's go in with some of the in between and the ground. Then we'll have everything kind of approximately laid in. All right, laid in exactly? No, but laid in pretty good. And that's really what we're all shooting for at this stage. It's for it to look pretty darn good. And then hopefully from pretty good, you get it to look good. And then eventually really good. But let's start with pretty good. A little bit more orange that I have to see right in here. Whoa, look how light that is. Way too light. It's a value thing. So more burnt sienna back into that. A little stronger than I wanted, but that may work. It's gonna, it's part, part of it is gonna be an underpainting. <clears throat> more burnt sienna. I want it darker. But I see a lot of oranges. And not, not orange where it's bright orange, but orange where it's leaning. And that's what we're doing. We're looking for kind of leaning areas of color. Now, if you get that right, where a color leans as opposed to how it finishes, then you just have a little, and as uh, uh, for lack of a better way of describing it, and I've heard this described before, I can't remember who, I think it might have been Scott Christensen, talks about bending colors, which is an interesting term. I don't necessarily adhere to the concept of bending a color, but what you're doing is you're, you're taking that color and you're shaping it. You're giving it a little bit of a different characteristic. So I'm staying kind of in the lime area. And for that, I'm using a little Naples, a little ochre and a little, little white and a little um, sap green. It's probably the brightest color that's gonna happen in the painting is right here. And if a little of that background color comes through, all the better. I kind of like, it's kind of a nice color. Even the little orange that I drew with might work. Now we're gonna come over on this side, same color, same thing. There's some foliage breaking down over it, which we'll get to. I could have left it, but I paint, didn't paint it in. So we'll come all the way over to this tree. I'm gonna go a little more ochre at that point. Why? I see it happen. And a little on this side and we're this I'm probably gonna leave real undone. I want this, I don't want it to be heavily focused down in this area. So I'm gonna leave that real sketchy. And at least the plan is. If I don't like it, I obviously won't leave it. And that's the other thing. If you don't like it, don't leave it. Even though it was a plan and it looked pretty good at the time, you have to assess your painting as it progresses. And the, the trick in that is not being so in love with one thing that you say, I'm gonna keep it no matter what, because even though you may keep it, it may not work appropriately. So we're gonna move back from this area. This area looks like it comes a little bit right up in there. These are very indicative. And I'm getting a little, little bit more sap into that color. So it goes a little darker and there's a little bit more ochre as I add the sap and we'll go a little bit, it's probably a little, a little darker than I was intending, but if I just brush it a little bit, it'll work its way right into the paint. 
and it won't be that it won't stand out that much. I just personally don't like there to be any. It's the way that I, there are guys that paint like this too, and they'll paint with one beautiful big flat color, maybe break it up just a little bit. Uh, very. I was looking at some art yesterday by a really wonderful Sonoma artist up here named Dennis Siminski, and that's what he'll tend to do. He'll tend to paint areas very design oriented, beautifully designed, and with gorgeous, gorgeous, very, very, like, you know, yummy color. Technical. That's me. Yeah, that's me talking technical. Now, there's a little bit of a of a, an area back here. It's kind of or yellow orange, and it's just a change of from what would be the vineyard probably to what is just. Uh, brush. It changes a little bit lighter and a little bit warmer. And I, do I see any on the other side? I see it, but I see it darker. I see it right about in here. It's a little bit redder. And maybe back here a little bit, just rubbed my brush over a little bit. Okay. And what we're doing is you're moving colors around. So we're going to get into some of the greener foliage. Well, I'm right there. So I don't have to go back to it. So that green foliage has got a combination of a lot of different colors that I've used. I've used yellow, I've used ochre, I've used a little bit of cat orange, definitely some sap green. I'm gonna try this right here. Probably a little greener than I want. I'm gonna throw a little bit more ochre into it. And we'll kind of come in, we'll hit what we can, for lack of a better term, what I would call the light areas of the um, foliage. It's a mountain back behind it too. Now I can put it in, right now I don't have it in there, so I'm probably not gonna put it in. But at the end, if I want to, I can always go back and say, you know, I think I'll throw that mountain back in there. more ochre, it's gotten a little bit too green on me. A little bit of yellow back into the color. So I'm augmenting that color, seems like all the time. A little more orange down here. Comes down to about here. Then it switches over. I'm standing back for just a second. A little bit in here. Okay, I'm gonna go a little lighter because I'm gonna go for that. So I'm gonna take Naples to that same color as using a little bit of medium, some yellow, some ochre, a little bit of green. Let me try this. Nah, it's too light. I thought it might be, I wasn't sure. So a little more ochre, a little more green. Try it one more time. That feels better. It's kind of finding the color. It's, it's interesting. Um, I used to, I came up with a term probably 25 years ago uh, in a class. I was talking with a student one time and I said, you've got to get in. I just, and you've got to do some more color searching. And so I've used that term quite a bit ever since, color searching. In other words, you're trying to find the color and in doing so you're, you're testing this way, you're testing that way. And it's the, it's the various tests that give the, your piece uh, character and flavor, so to speak. So it isn't just a green, it's a mixture of several of the greens that you've worked to try and find as you paid it. Went a little too light, I think, but let's give it a shot. Push it into the color and it'll work. Put 
little orange because I'm seeing as it comes near this one tree, it gets a little, and the orange just tends to be too light. So I have to keep going back and picking up the, um, that's a little too colorful, but I'll go back and pick up the um, burnt sienna. The burnt sienna tends to work just a little bit better. It isn't quite as, as harsh of a, uh, of a warm. I'm gonna leave that alone. I can see up close, I'm not crazy about it, but from a distance, it works okay. I'm gonna take a little bit more CAD, I mean, a little bit more of the Naples and go a little lighter, right? And a few of these areas. Okay, so now this smudge here is the tree in the background. I kind of want to keep as much of the transparency as I can, because I like it. So we're going to come in and we're going to hit a few little negatives. A little bit up here. And a little bit on this side. And then we'll leave it alone. Okay. I can go too far with it and spend way too long on it. Even Not that it wouldn't warrant that. It's that you have to disperse your time appropriately. Um, unless you're doing a studio painting, which in which case it really doesn't matter. But again, I, I think I've mentioned because these are 90 minute paintings, I try and approach them very much the way that I approach a piece if I were painting on location. So I try and make it so it's basically done in 90 minutes at the 90 minute mark. So Lynn was saying that sometimes her color searching takes her down the wrong path. Yeah, it does. That's where that's that comes from experience, truthfully. The more you do it, the more you'll have a feel for do I pick up a sap, do I pick up a blue, do I pick up an earth tone? You know, there's no fast, and you guys, I know a lot of you already know this, so I'm not I'm kind of preaching to the choir to a degree. Um, there's no fast way to learn this. And when I was younger, I wish there was. Now that I'm older and I've learned some stuff, glad there's not. <laughs> Otherwise, everyone would be really, really a dynamite artist. And there'd be no variation. So I think variations of style happens as you progress and begin to discover things. You discover, geez, I kind of like this unfinished quality, or I like that. There's an abstract aspect to this that I really want to hang on to. And you may, or I, I like the refinement that I'm getting. I want to use more refinement in my work. All of that'll happen, all of it. If you just give it time. So let's get a little bit of work on the ground. What do you say? Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I cleaned the brush somewhat, but I'm gonna go back to my earth tone and a little bit of blue, because I don't want it too bright. And I'm just squeezing a lot of the uh, color out of the ferrule. So it's, it's whoops, I went a little too blue with it, I think. And I'll go back and bring a little unbleached titanium. I want to kind of hit in, that's pretty good. Okay, let's get a little medium into that because it's going on real dry. Part of that is good, part of it's not. Okay. Just had to stand back for a second, see what the value was like. It's just about right, but I don't have enough of that color mixed up, so I'm mixing up more. Unbleached titanium, alt umber, and ultramarine blue. And lots go, oh, there's a root, son of a gun. I just realized that's a big old honkin. I don't know if I'm gonna paint it that way. I don't like that. It's really, it, it almost doesn't look convincing in reality. So that brings up another comment we ought to talk about. Just because something is there, doesn't mean you have to paint it. You're, you're like the creator of this, this little world that you're creating, this visual and if you don't like the way something was working, don't do it. You can, you can leave things out. You can move. If, if you don't like where a branch sits, move it. 
Okay, so we've darkened it at its point of origin right here. Then it comes all the way over here. It looks like it has a little bit of warmth. So I brought a little bit of burnt sienna as it comes over here. Oh, I think that's a color I mixed up by accident. I don't think that's part of the, but I kind of like the look of it. Okay, it goes down here, here, and then we get some pulls. So let's, we're just gonna really briefly indicate the feeling of shadows. And we're gonna come down here, over here. It'll be somewhat transparent. I don't mind that. And we're gonna come down there, there, there. All the way over to where that big trunk right here. Fun to work on these bigger sizes just because you have to move around and you have to move your arm more. Um, when you work small, you're, you're not working with your whole arm and it just doesn't feel as painty. You know, it feels more like, feels more like a painter when I'm working large, you know, even on location. And I'm, I talked to a group of artists just recently who all like to work 912 on location. Um, I very seldom work 912. I generally work 12, 16, occasionally 11, 14. Um, and 1620 is not an unusual. So I like a little bit of a larger size. I even work 1824. The largest I've attempted on location in a in a three, about a three and a half hour setting is a 24 by 36. You know, I, I did a two day setting, a 30 by 40 once where I worked three hours each day on it. That came out okay. Am I really proud of it? Nah, it looks it looks fine. I'm just not. I think part of the reason I maybe don't like it as much is because of its um content, composition. I don't know that I picked a really great great subject. I had kind of painted out an area, and I was still looking for something to do. And I had a big thirty by forty. I said, "I'll do that," and you know, it was. I I, I wasn't embarrassed by it. It just Subjectively, I don't know that I would have chosen that if I really given it a lot of thought. But I look at a lot of times my plein air stuff as exploratory work studies. And I know, so I've got basically the look that we have there. And I, what is it, about 35 minutes. So I've laid everything in. So now my concern is slowing down and refining. Okay. Because this is what we might call a completed lay-in. It's a very loose lay-in, but it, it is a lay-in nonetheless. So we're gonna come back, I'm gonna correct a couple of these shadows. This one. Shadow that comes across. It's not a sky there. Should be the sky. Okay, I need to lay. I'm going to grab my. I got a big tube of burnt umber. I squeeze that a whole lot more, even though I had a lot laid out there. Probably I'm going to need a little bit more green eventually too. But right now, that'll probably do it. Just a little bit more that I need to, needed to add there. Oh, the reason being, we want to start to get a little darker. Nothing is really dark now. So again, going to. The reason I'm cleaning my brush is I'm trying to get most of the light, light color out of it. So I'm going to grab the burnt umber, the ultramarine blue, which is going to give me as close to a warm black as I can get. Now, what the reason I'm doing that is I want to get that tree. Probably getting reflections too. So if you look, if I do this, let me put it in this way, and then I'll try and do my best to uh, change the direction of that, because it's glaring on me, so it must be glaring on you. But if I take uh, my big brush, something like this, and I just brush it this way, 
should make a difference. Should be able to see that better. I can, so I'm assuming you can. And what you're doing, we're just changing. When we have horizontal strokes, the light, the, the thickness of those strokes, the light picks it up, particularly if it's a dark. Um, so if you have a vertical stroke, it doesn't, it, it, it really doesn't hit as much because it has to hit from the sides. So I'm deepening all of these colors if I can, where I can. I'm going to pick up, I mean, this time I think I'm going to use some solvent free gel with it because it'll lay on top really nicely. So we're going to go really dark right here. Back in this background. So it almost merges. The, the darkness of the foliage almost merges with the, um, trunk. So I gave this a little more of an angle than it has, which I think is okay. So it's thicker I'm standing back for a second. I want to see how it feels. It feels okay. There's nothing wrong, I don't feel, right now. I just feel it's you know, it's at the stage it's at, it needs to go further. There's a branch that comes right about from here down. I'm gonna warm that up just a little, for some reason it just feels a little warmer. It might, might be my own misinterpretation, but it's not gonna hurt if I keep the value in the right range, which I which I am. It's staying all pretty dark. And then we get this bulge right a little bit more medium in it. I feel it was kind of laying on top and not or it wasn't laying on top. It was kind of pushing itself into the paint. So we want to come in with a little bulge and then this and it comes back darker right here where I may leave some of those beautiful transparents. Hopefully I can. So we'll get a little bit of a thin to thick characteristic in this painting. Always like it when I can make that work. But again, if it isn't working, I'm not gonna sacrifice the look of the painting for the characteristic of one area. I used to do that as a student, I swear. Um, I used to have these certain passages that I would do, you know, and we used to, as a student, call them happy accidents, whatever. And you go, well, I don't wanna lose that. I don't wanna lose that. But you know what, as, as, the whole, as a whole part of the painting, it didn't work. And it's one of those things that I learned later that you can't save areas and hope they're gonna work if it's not working. I mean, for the sake of that, if it has got a nice technical characteristic, Maybe you've got some drips into an area, or maybe you've got some way a wash went down that you love. But in the totality of your painting, if, if it isn't working, and, and who's going to determine that other than you? But if it's not working, don't leave it. Now we have some foliage. The reason I got this brush is I wanted to get some of this foliage that comes down right there. Kind of goes over. Okay, that, that's working okay when I stand back. Up close, it's a bunch of paint strokes. Back, it, it, feel, it has the characteristic that I'm looking for. So I'm gonna take that same color, mix it in with some of the other locals that I have, and we're gonna start in with some of these other darker areas that I have that are slightly transparent line some foliage here and this is from this background tree and over here definitely but I'm still keeping it kind of thin you can still see the brush the only place we have to worry about things is as it goes down and overlaps 
some of that foliage down there, some of the green that we have down in that area. It's going to go back here, going to work its way up. Really, this is where you're just pressure. It's not, I'm not applying the same kind of pressure I did earlier, just kind of dusting it on. So that's probably the best description that I can come up with. I, more of a dusting. And you're dusting it on a wet paint. So that's not that easy, by the way. So I'm going to pick up some more medium because I want this to sit on top. Now, from here, I want this foliage to come down and work its way down over that tree a little bit. And then we'll go into some of the darks on that tree. I'm going to take burnt sienna into the color I was using, and maybe just a little bit of a of an unbleached titanium or something. We're going to put some shadows. So it's not going to be quite, it may look dark, but it's not as dark as some of the other areas. Up here, some shadows, definitely on this part of the tree. But I'm not making it as thick either. I don't want the tree to, to occupy the kind of width. In other words, the width of that tree, which is made up of several trunks, is visually almost the same as that width. I don't want that. So I've narrowed this so they don't have the same um, visual characteristic. And we'll, some of the foliage comes down or overlaps. It's kind of very, now as we move up, I'm gonna take some more sap green to that color, some more medium. And we're gonna get, start to get some of this foliage in here a little bit stronger. Get it darker still, more brown, more blue. And I put some thick strokes, vertical, horizontal strokes in there, which I will switch off in a second and soften them with that big brush again. That's all I do is I rub that brush so it's pretty free of pigment. And do this. Hopefully that helps. It helps me. I hope it helps you. I get a little bit of a glare, but not like I did before. Again, I'm using one brush to apply paint and the other brush to manipulate paint. So I'm not using, this brush is applying the paint, somewhat manipulating, but this is the brush where I'm really kind of coming in and getting it to work. But I'm also doing the reason I'm using so many, I may use a horizontal every now and then, but then I'll come over it with a vertical. So if I use a horizontal, great, wonderful, but I want to come over it with a vertical down, down, and then off to the side. Okay, so that almost works now. It's kind of interesting. Even though I haven't gone and painted any of the positive areas of the tree, it is beginning to feel like a tree back there. Which makes me so happy. Okay. Okay, that's it's starting to work. I'm going to go to the left. I'm going to keep my eye on the time. Okay. I want to get into the body of the tree, but I want to get a little bit more of the foliage taken care of before I get into it. So we're applying more pigment, thicker and slightly wet because I, I need the medium in there. Otherwise, it's just going to push itself into the paint. And we got a nice tree trunk up here. 
and I call it free trunk. It's a branch, but it's so thick. It's almost like a trunk. And we'll go and apply some more into the foliage. And if I need to bust on an edge or two, I will do that now. All right, paint's dry, I can feel it. So I'm gonna add some turp this time. Just a touch. Paint's still kind of dry. Okay, the more layers I put on this, the more I can make it convincing. And in a short painting, an a la prima, meaning all at once painting, you, you don't have the opportunity to let those, some of those areas set up. So therefore you're constantly coming over and you're painting a little bit more wet into wet, which is, if you handle it right, is absolutely gorgeous. If you handle it wrong, it can look dirty and clumsy. And if, when it, if it gets dirty and clumsy, let it dry or take some, scrape it off and do it again, or let it dry and then paint over it and use it as part of your underpainting. These again, a la prima, these are a la prima. A la prima means you're doing it all in one shot. Direct painting, so you're not glazing and building and any of that stuff. You're just basically, teacher of mine used to call it honest painting. I'm not sure about that, <laughs> but um, in other words, you can't fake it because you're doing it all in one shot. You can't go back and soften things and you have to make it all work in that one glorious layer. And, you know, we, we don't know truthfully what a lot of our heroes that are deceased, the, the John Singer Sargents of the world, Anders Zorn, people like that, Nikolai Petsch, we don't know if they went back and did it. it a lot of their stuff looks very a la prima, like it was all done in one shot. But we truly don't know. I mean, you know that... A, a, a nice plain air. We know that, if, if, let me give you an example of that. Um, Monet's water lilies. If you go back and look at those, there are so many layers of dry paint on dry paint on dry, and it encrusts in such a gorgeous way. It builds so much uh, character that we know that it was done. We can look and understand that it was done in layers. But there are other painters, we can't tell. So I'm getting the thickness, the kind of boldness in that foliage that I really need before I move on to the body of the tree and the ground. And then I can always come back to it. I can always come back to that, any of these areas, even though we're getting, getting them in now. If I feel like it later and I feel like I need to do more, I can come back. Sometimes you just use the side of that brush, sometimes the tip. The various facets of the brush, if you, if you use your brush and you use it as a paint brush and not as a house painting brush, um, you can get a lot of characteristics. And that's what painting is all about. It's really developing the characteristics and the illusions, at least impressionism, is that we're not painting every leaf on a tree. We're painting the feeling of a group of leaves. And we're painting the, the effect, or the look of a lot of layers of bark. We're not painting, you know. So everything is, as I can see it now, is beginning to work. Okay, so let's go in and start to get a little bit into the tree itself. Um, probably I'm gonna, Keep the dark in this brush, so I'm not going to clean it. I'm going to pick up a spare brush. And we're going to start in on hitting some of these areas, which tend to have an ochre quality. It's dappled light. It's the same kind of dappled light that we're going to use on the ground plane. 
But and before we do dappled light on the ground plane, we want to look for variations within the shadow. Warmer over here, I can see a lot more red in the shadow over in this region, a little bit more blue down in here, darker here, a little lighter here. As it moves away, as a shadow moves away from its point of origin, more of the ambient light of any specific area can get to it. And because of that, it'll, it will appear to be slightly lighter. Hope that all makes sense. It's a very naturalistic way of looking at it. So I grabbed one of these real cheap brushes because the, the bristles are so erratic that it really lays down kind of a nice erratic characteristic that gives the foliage a little bit more believability. So I'm gonna go in with some of the ochres up here. We're gonna start here, work our way over, down, move down to this area, all the way down, and then we'll start up here and work our way down. So start with a pure ochre and maybe a touch of brown and maybe a touch of warmth. In this case, the warmth. And I know I'm gonna need medium. So this is a test. I think it's too colorful right off the top of my head. I think it's too colorful, but I'm gonna try it anyway. I'm gonna start right here. It is a little too colorful, but I don't mind it. I'm gonna leave it. There's a little piece of light happening here. And then I'm gonna take the unbleached titanium into that color. And we're gonna come in on this part and then on the edge, when it goes down, I find doing this kind of stuff, if I use too big of a brush, um, I actually do it better. It feels when I do, when I use a small brush and try and do it exact, uh, what I felt about, this is about how I feel about my own work. It feels forced. It doesn't feel as natural and fun. Like as I stand back now, that's working pretty well. I can see some areas that need work there, but it, it's working pretty well. So I'm gonna take the same color, maybe darken it just a touch. And we're gonna do it's a little sliver of light happening right about here. Strong right there, okay? And then this wonderful dappled light effect as it comes down right about in here before it gets to this V, right about here. Get a little piece of light, then another one below it. You can actually make this stuff up um, once you've painted it a lot. We also wanna get some of the subtle shadows going on. Now, this edge of the tree, right? Oh, I can actually see on, geez, on this one, I see just a hint of light happening right there on that branch. Ah, mess that one up. Go back with my dark. Okay. Let's come all the way down to the base. A little darker. Not as... So we're blending it in to a degree. Comes down a little. So I can go back and break that up if it's too, it is a little too flat. As it works its way up here, it gets lighter. So I can add some, some maples, some ochre to that same color right about here. I like this nice transparent, uh, my underpainting coming through here, we get down in here a little bit. I want to get a little variation in that color. Okay, it, it works okay, I think. I think I need more as it moves out away from the lightest part, it gets a little darker and warmer. We'll go right in here. And right down to the bottom gets a little warm right at this point. So we're gonna hit, it didn't go warm enough. Let's do it one more time. Okay. Pick up some brown. A little bit of a, in between tone right in here. Now we get some cooler colors. I just noticed it. Why is the, the more you start observing, you know, when you initially lay something in and you lay it in and you don't really observe closely, but now I'm beginning to see some cools happen, right? Oh, a little too blue. There and then on the underside, right? And a lot of times what you put in in that shadow detail will really 
help determine the believability of your lights. So let's go back to my lights on the tree, the ochre and the, and the navels. And we're going to go right about above this. At about this point, we get a little piece of light right here. And then right there, even brighter, right down here. The, the paint strokes, I'm, I'm very pleased with the character of the strokes. I don't know how it, I hope the effect is, is as good as the strokes are. And that's what you want. You want, uh, at least I, I'm, I'm, when I say you, I mean me. <laughs> what I'm after really is to get a really nice balance between paint and reality. Okay, so we're gonna keep moving. I don't wanna get hung up in any one area too long. As you almost get a little bit of a dapple coming through, not quite, above this, right about in here. I'm gonna go a little darker, just throw a little bit more umber into that color. Right about in here, up in here, down here. So it works, it's I'm mixing it back into this kind of a brown ochre color and it works its way down here it becomes quite a bit brighter eventually down around in here. Okay, and a little more colorful. So we're gonna start with that. Take okay, I'm gonna put a little bit of a shadow down. So we're gonna start with that. And we're gonna take that right into that other color. I think I'm gonna need some more ochre. Get that in a second. Um, but we're gonna work our way right up here. That's just about right. So we're gonna take that, work it up here, work it up here, lift up on that brush. I'm standing back and I wanna get the effect. Okay, I don't like this at all, but for now we're gonna leave it. I'll get, hopefully I'll remember enough to get back to it. Somebody remind me, say, hey, that one area you didn't like. Hey, that one area you didn't like. Don't, don't remind me now. Remind me later. Oh, that's way too light there. I don't know what the heck I was thinking. I was getting too confident. You know, you start to pretend like you know what you're doing, like I tell you to do, and you don't judge. As you make, as you put something down, you don't quite judge it. And then you realize later, what the hell was I thinking? And boy, that's probably my most common phrase when I'm done with the painting. Or how did I miss that? That's another one. <laughs> and you know what's really the worst part is you get a friend. I'll never forget, I had a friend come over one time to a painting idea. And he said, how come you got that tangency from the shadow to the, the leg? And I went, I didn't even realize it. And all of a sudden I went, yeah, you're right. This a painting, I had a painting, it literally had been done probably for a year. Just sitting around my studio, something I liked. And uh, that I probably posted before was an artist at, at his table. And someone came over and picked that out. And I went, oh my God, absolutely right. I, and it had been sitting around. I just hadn't looked at it, hadn't taken care and really, you know, realized that there were things wrong with it. Well, misspelled telephone and telephone, huh? the British telephone booth. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And it just reminded me of one. I, I, so I did a painting and the painting came out really well. I was really happy with it. Right. And I photographed it. And while I was looking at the photograph, I think there was other artists looking at it with me, if I'm not mistaken. And he might be able to, was there someone? And someone said, did you misspell telephone on purpose? It was a British telephone booth in front of the thing. And I had totally misplaced the letters. 
I had a Teflon <laughs> and I hadn't realized it. It was done. I had photographed it. All of a sudden I went, oh my God. So I had to go back in. Once again, you start and you just don't realize some things. And I'm in the middle of painting it. Looks good. <laughs> so it looked better when I fixed it. But that's, that's kind of what happens. And it's easy, easy for you to overlook something. So you can leave something and then go back. You can go back at any time with oil. Watercolor, different story. Okay, so we've got a little bit of that, a little bit of light coming through right up high, but nowhere near as bright. So I went back to a little bit browner color, right about in here. A little piece of white that happens here. Get some warm colors sneaking through every now and then up, up in these areas. Okay, so we're going to hold off. I know I need more right in here, particularly. I need some subtle darks because there's more texture showing. And the texture appears to be like this. Trying to recorrect some of the drawing in the shadow here. So Tom has a question. Is some of your paint real thick and then some will paint just kind of scumbling? Yes, color, exactly. It's thin to thin or thick to thin, however you, you know, where you want to put your emphasis. Yes, it's, it's that's and that's intentional. So do you sometimes want painting to be all thick or is it a mixture or is a mixture okay? The uh, mixture is okay, but sometimes I want a painting to be all thick. Um, generally more high key paintings. Usually on low key paintings, you don't want a lot of your heavy darks to be real thick. Um, so it really has a, uh, it has to do with what you're painting, um, how you feel about what you're painting. There's a big knot hole here, I see. I didn't catch that right in the beginning. But you generally start out thin. I always start out thin. I, I shouldn't say oh every now and then every now and then I'll just for the hell of it more for exploratory purposes I will go thick but generally I almost always start out thin and sometimes I will scrape stuff off when I, when I get too thick and often you will find and I know artists that work this way that what when you scrape something off you actually come up with certain effects that you probably could, wouldn't have gotten any other way. And you learn something that, hey, maybe I can use something like this in the future. Okay, let's get a little bit of color back in this. We'll go to the ground and then we'll come back up and finish up up in here because we're gonna just, under 30 minutes. So I'm going to go with that warm uh, orange and ochre, a little bit of maybe a burnt sienna in, mixed into it. And we're going to go right here. That's just about right. And we'll go with the next tree. And then that color, I'm going to take a little bit of glycerin to it because I want it, as this moves up, it gets white happening in different areas. And just a little bit here, because the light is affecting more from this side. That's why we're getting more light over there.
it's kind of uh, it's beginning to work. You probably could get a little lighter just by patting a little bit more ochre to it over on this side. Whoops. Let's do it one more time. Oh, I'm going to add a little bit of a, there we go, try that. Leave it at that. Not going to do a lot more. It's it's pretty effective, so I don't want to jeopardize it. We want to come in over on this area with some more foliage, but not quite as dark. We'll just kind of dry brush it in there. Drag it over. Oh, I kind of like that. Mess it up, but I like it. An effect I probably couldn't have planned. A little bit darker, a lot of red, kind of all the way up in here. We get a lot of abstracted, kind of bright color. I took some yellow and mixed it in with a lot of the color that I already had. And I'm just kind of doing a fetching esque application of paint where it's really kind of dry, kind of sitting on top of whatever I can get it to sit on top of. But leave that alone. Now we're going to move across and see if I see anything else like that, and I do. So as I move to the left, I see a little bit of a light happening right here. There's a little more green in it. We just bring a little bit more green to that same color. Bring it down here, over here. Every now and then a little bit of back in here, a little bit under. And that helps define that part of the tree. So it goes up. And we get a little bit of light, almost skylight happening right. And we can go back and pick up a little sky if I want to. Right. And we might pick up a little bit here, here. This is that more of a crummy Home Depot brush. And Home Depot wouldn't like me to say that, but. Um, and a lot of medium, and I can just kind of set that brush down and let it make a mark. Can you talk about the brushes that you're using again? I, I have, the only two brushes I've really used have been these two. Um, one, this one is from Home Depot. It's, it's just a house painting brush. And, uh, but its bristles are so kind of messed up to a degree because it's not real neat that it allows you to put strokes down in such a way that you wouldn't plan them. And if you just learn how to, let the bristles do the work and you not over force it. Probably the, that would be the best line that I could give to anybody is don't over force it. Let the, you know, I, I've mentioned in the past, let the brush do the work, don't you? If you were forcing the work, then it's probably not coming out as strong as it could. So you wanna kind of keep a little bit of a, you want, it, it's, it's, I'm trying to find the right word. It's like um, uncontrolled control, if that makes any sense to you. So it's like you're you're not over controlling it. You're still putting your brush down, letting it do the work, but you're careful the way you put it down. You're careful with the marks 
that you're allowing it to make. And if it, if it doesn't do what you want it to, you're going to go back and change it, which is truthfully, that is the truth of painting. That is really the secret to all painting. Repeat that. <laughs> yeah. If it isn't doing the way that you want it to look, go back and redo it. Get it until it works. Once it works, then you're okay. Right? But initially, if it isn't working, do something else. What is it? Insanity? That's that, that great line. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. We could, we could apply that 100% to painting. Now, someone was asking me about paint thickness. Generally, your light colored paints are gonna be your thickest. Well, I'm standing back. It's beginning to work okay, but I think I need to get on that ground plane and then go back into here just a little bit. I still haven't dealt with this, which is a part of the mountains way back there, which tend to be almost a sky color. So I just take the sky color in with a little bit of, um, I can kind of go back and fake in what we might call mountains. I'll just leave that alone. Okay, let's get the ground plane. So we can see down in here, we're gonna start with the orange or ground plane colors. And I'm gonna take maples, so a lot of medium, maples, a little bit of a cat orange hue, and some ochre. Maybe a little bit of burnt sienna. And we'll start down, we're gonna go a little warmer still, more of the cat orange hue. And we're gonna start down in this corner where it tends to be the warmest. So we're gonna go here, here, a little bit up here, and a little bit more ochre into it now. Break into it. it. This is the kind of stuff you can play with this for a long time and go back and forth and augment your colors a little bit, change them up a little bit here and there. Um, But we're going to start with the orange colors and we'll work our way up to the almost whitish yellow. And remember, it's a flat ground, so your strokes aren't probably going to go up and down. And you can make some of it up. If you're wrong in some of it, no one's going to know. As long as it appears correct. That's the whole truth about painting, too. Landscapes are great because they give you a different type of freedom than figure painting. And figure painting is great because it gives you a different kind of discipline. And still life can be kind of in between. Generally, it's a little more disciplined. I always, I've always akin to still life painting a little bit closer to figure painting, just because we're painting objects, things. And then in landscape, you're painting kind of feelings and effects, whether it's weather effects, effects of foliage. So now we've got a lot of the oranges in there. Um, I do wanna get a little bit in here as an underpainting. I 
because everything isn't a, one perfect flat color. I have a little bit of it back in here, real thin, way in the background. So it's not gonna be big, thick strokes. Where up front, you might be a little bolder. We have a little, now that's too, a little too light, but we'll go back and thin it out once again. See, I did fuss a little on that that I told you I was gonna try and do it later. Okay, so we're gonna we're going to go into a little bit of a lighter color now. Um, how do you avoid getting too picky with those shapes? What? No, how do you avoid getting too picky with those shapes? Stay with a big brush and move fast from one area to another. That's basically. I don't know if you guys heard that, or if it was a question someone asked. Anna asked it. How do you avoid getting too picky with those shapes? Keep moving. Just put them in there, and again. It goes back to that saying that I use all the time, just assume you're doing it right. You, you know, if you sit there and analyze it as you do it, you're gonna find all kinds of problems, I guarantee you. So I mixed up right into that color, I mixed up a lot more ochre and a lot more CAD, not CAD, um, uh, Naples. And we're gonna start right about here. So in this case, I'm not going through as many layers as I probably would on a, a, a super finished type of painting studio because of time. Mix a little of that color back in there. So we kind of come in between. So let me stand back. I can still go lighter and I'm going to, I'm going to take more CAD, excuse not CAD, I'm going to take more of the Naples into that. As I put more Naples into it, I'm adding a little bit more medium. And what we're going to do is start real bright right here. Really bright. And this is going to carry on to the Yeah. But to pick up a little bit of the yellow. Yeah. Let me go over on the side. Pull it away. Most of these strokes that I'm making tend to feel have a horizontal movement. You know, it may not be 100% horizontal, but the because that's the way the ground is. We stand back. See if I get the movement about right. It looks okay. We want to come in here, real strong here, up and over. Up about here. Get a lot of yellow. So sometimes I like to do it with a knife, but in, I don't want to switch it over right now, just for time. It's a little bit of a larger piece too. So now I can go lighter and go white with maples and medium. So we're putting a, putting a bright finish layer on. You can see how, how much brighter you can go. So we, you get that very, you'd have to have that variation. You can't just literally 
do a flat color and call it quits. You literally need the variation. Now, as that variation works its way, what do we got about five minutes? Now I got about a little over five. Up into the tree, we're gonna get some, <clears throat> some of the brighter lights. Now, this point, I'm not going to, but I could switch down to a smaller brush and be a little bit more careful. But because it's a big, loose painting, I'm keeping the integrity of the way it started. And it started as a big, loose painting, and I'm gonna finish it that way. I'm not gonna finish it like a really tight, refined piece. You would use better brushes if you did that. Right? Yeah, a little bit. Just switch down. Maybe it's maybe a sable here and there. Um, sometimes I go, I don't want to dirty another brush, but I just dirtied another brush. Nice big sable. So we're going to go here. Now it's got a, this is part of this red. I don't like that root at all. So I'm not, but what I can do is there's, there is, um, light hitting over in there. So I can come back with the feeling of a little bit of light on the ground right about here. And I'm making much neater strokes with this brush. It's a, it's has a much more of a refined characteristic. And so you're going to get a neater kind of a paint stroke out of it. So you went thin because this hill this is a hill that sits on. This hill is going this way. It's going this way, this way, to where it's flat on the tree, to where it's starting to slope down. And that's why you're getting these shapes as they face you are becoming more, um, they're becoming larger. And as they move into the distance, they become narrower. Another way to do that is to take one of these um, call them crummy brushes, but take one of these um, brushes like this, uh, clear it off. Pick up the light and then come in with a few. Really? Go back into the background and break those shapes up. They don't have to stay big flat. If there's a little bit of a subtlety into the shape, you go back and you change that just a little bit. You don't need to change it a lot. This bothers me. It's a big kind of hole. Now this area tends to get a little darker in here too. So I could go back into the shadows it's a little cooler a little darker so i might want to look back up into the tree and see if there's anything else that i want to get up in those kind of regions now that might be a little bit of a Scott, just let that brush just bear. I don't even feel the brush touching the as I as I do these strokes. I don't. I li literally do not feel it. This at the bo this bothers me right here. But that's just really ugly. So let's fix it. Let's get that mountain back in there. And I can take area of the mountain, go a little bit lighter as it goes behind the foliage. The distance is working pretty well, better than I thought it was at, at first. Um, 
I wasn't really knocked out in the beginning the way that I was getting. Uh, I want to get depth and the feeling of space. So a lot of it might be layering. I might have to come back and do more layering on top. Um, I might be darks on lights, lights on darks, both. Right now, I've, I'm putting the lights, I'm putting the negatives. Now, I might have to go back and do a few positives. But the overall effect, I'm standing back now. The overall effect is working. Um, I've got a little bit of that, uh, what do you call it, knot hole right there in that tree. This tree is beginning to work, although I'm not crazy about some of those edges. So I might wanna work, work its way back into the, um, and as that breaks down, there, you wanna overlap as much as you can whenever you're painting. Um, I really recommend that. Overlap is what, if, if, if you can't get it through lighting, distance, dimension through lighting, you can get it through overlapping. So if lighting isn't working for you, work for overlapping. This is a real big dead area and there is a little activity in there, not a lot, but there is a little bit. One of the areas, see a little bit of a, here and I might just take some nice darks that are slightly green, slightly brown. Making it too strong. I'll show you in a second when that happens. Stronger than I wanted, let's put it that way. So once I get it like that, I'll stand back. I don't I don't even like the way it looks from a distance. See so I take this big brush, clean it off. Just do a lot of this wiping back and forth. This doesn't feel as dead. This feels a little dead. Um, what do we got here time-wise? Okay, we got about two minutes. Actually, we don't, but I'm gonna take two minutes. <laughs> Bring that up, break a little bit more. And then right up above it, where's that there? Give me one of these brushes. The, oh, I'm gonna take a light, warm color, a lot of ochre. And I see, More ochre. So overall, it's it's okay. That area bothers me a little bit. I want to. If I dwelled on every area that bothered me, we'd be here for another two hours. Um, but the effect, the effect is there. And that's in a, in a rapid painting, whether you're painting a figure, whether you're painting um, a landscape, whether you're painting a still life in, a, in a, a rapid painting that you're painting quickly. That's what you're really all about is the effect. How effective is your mark making? How effective is your decisions in color? All those things are part of learning as you do rapid paintings. Um, you can always go back and take any rapid painting and turn it into a more refined painting at any time, if you wish. And occasionally I've done that. Occasionally I've done that because I'll look at something and I'll go, you know, that's got more potential. I just, I didn't carry it as far as it should. And so I have done that with even plain air pieces. Um, not real often. And I generally don't go back, put a lot of extra time into things when I've done something like this, which is kind of um, a one shot, get it done type of painting, I, I, I don't go back into them very often because there's a, a certain amount of integrity that happens when you're painting quickly. And 
I want some of that to come through. And, you know, I want those, some of the wrong decisions, not that you want them to come through, but they're part of your painting process. They're part of your decision-making. So, you know, allow it to occur when it happens. In any event, you guys, um, thanks. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to you guys for watching. Again, if you weren't watching, I'd just be sitting and talking to myself, painting a picture. Um, and so I do appreciate that, Scott. Thank you. And other than that, I'm probably just going to sign off because uh, I think it's almost lunchtime for me. Bye-bye, guys. Keep painting. Thank you.